Welcome to Christian Living 101 Bible Studies. Our mission is to prepare every believer for the trials of daily life. Listen to God's Word presented without church or organizational bias as you study with Pastor Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. My heart is like a house One day I let my Savior in there were many rooms we used to visit now and then Then one day he found that door I knew the day had come too soon And I said, Jesus, I'm not ready For you to visit in that room Cause that's a place in my heart or even I don't go I had some things hidden there I didn't want no one to know But then he handed me the key With tears of love on his face He said, I've come to set you free Let me go in your secret place as he opened up that door And as the two of us walked in Lord, I was so ashamed As life revealed my hidden sin And when I think about that room now I'm not ashamed anymore Because I know my hidden sin no longer hides behind that door Is there a place in your heart Where even you don't go You got that thing hidden there That you don't want no one to know But then he's handed you that key See the tears of love on his face now he came to set you free Let him go in your secret place You know he died to set you free Let him go in your secret place We're going to talk to you about what God says concerning the responsibility of the pastors and the prophets and this comes forth from the Old Testament, of course, as well as the New Testament, but certainly God gave strict instructions in the Old Testament about the responsibility of those who are supposed to lead us in spiritual things. And so we want to talk to you about that today. I hope it's a blessing to your heart. I'm going to start with Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 1, which goes this way. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep, of my pasture, saith the Lord. Verse 2, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Verse 3, And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and increase. We look at our own country, and, and it's a tragedy as to where we have gone in this past 150 years. You know, there was a day when this was considered a Christian land. All the world looked to us as a Christian nation. And uh, yes, there were those in the world that hated us because we were serving Christ, but never in the dimension that we find today. Today we have the problem that we have because we have uh, forsaken the call of Almighty God as the ministers of his flock. And we need to understand that we will and have already paid a terrible price. But it's just beginning. And as we look at the situation in our land, we find that there are very few uh, pulpits in America that hold a man of God that is preaching the 
pure word of God and is declaring the truth about the scriptures and is making it clear what the responsibility of a true Christian is. As a result, we have become an embarrassment unto God and we have become a source of ridicule uh, from all the earth round about us because they look at us and say, well, you're not a Christian nation anymore. The truth of the matter is because of our own misdeeds, because of our own uh, well-intentioned perhaps, but certainly actions of error, uh, we have brought ourselves to a place where we no longer see the power of God being revealed in the land because of the Word of God is not going forth. The Word of God is more than, well, brother, you just have to love each other, and God understands all the rest. That's the biggest lie in all the world. Yes, we need to love each other, but we don't need to come to the place where we think that God is not a judge anymore. We think that the Word of God is not a strong directive anymore. And the only thing that we do today, and I'm talking about the multitude of, of pastors today, are more interested in bringing forth the, the Word that satisfies the tickling ears of the public than they are of preaching the old fashioned word of God wherein the power of God was released and the conviction of the Holy Spirit was applied and the powers of darkness was uh, fearful and, and shook as it were in their boots when the presence of God began to be declared. But you see if we don't declare the entire word of God then we water it down. Now Jesus taught us in Matthew 24 and we've discussed it many times uh, when he was talking to the disciples, and certainly all those words have been passed on to us by the grace and the power and the mercy of God that we might have the scriptures today. Uh, but uh, the first thing Jesus said, do not be deceived. And we have false Christ, false Christians, false pastors, false uh, prophets uh, uh, that are uh, deleting much of the scripture just by ignoring it and never speaking it, never teaching upon it, never declaring the holiness of God and the inability of God to accept sin and the works of sin in those who call him Lord. We need to come to the place where we recognize when I accepted sin and asked God to forgive me of my sin through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I did follow through with repentance, and I did follow through with water baptism, I came to that place where I had a responsibility before Almighty God and before all the rest of the world to set an example about what a Christian is really to be. The biggest lie as far as holiness is concerned is that it comes out of the Catholic Church. Now are you saying, well, Pastor, uh, uh, everybody in the Catholic Church is an uh, is, uh, 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 unbeliever and, and ungodly? And No, I'm not saying that. There are those within the Catholic Church that love the Lord with all of their heart, have truly been converted, and are serving the Lord according to the knowledge that God has given unto them. And I want you to know that uh, I'm not condemning the people, I'm condemning the system. And the system is known as Christianity today, and it's the real work of the Antichrist, and it's the religion of the Antichrist and Satan himself, and it carries forth a, a message of, that denies the power of God and substitutes the ability of men to uh, take that power from God and to work upon it, which none of them can do because only God can do what God does. We can't do what God does. We might be an instrument that God can use uh, and a channel that flows through us, the Holy Spirit and the Word, unto others, uh, but it's God's power that does it all. And we need to come to a place of understanding that because someone says they're a Christian, oh, well, you say the Catholic Church. No, I won't limit it to the Catholic Church. I want to go back a little bit, and I want to tell you that most of Protestant uh, uh, America is, uh, in many instances, more guilty than the 
Catholic Church in many ways because they should know better. They should walk in the light of the Lord that God has given unto them and that the foundation of our uh, spiritual experience was taught. Uh, and we need to come back to the place where the old-fashioned gospel was preached. Uh, yes, the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the long-suffering of God, but we also need to come back to the place where we, and I speak to us as pastors, where we as pastors, pastors uh, continue to tell the world that yes God is all of those things but he's also a God of purity and holiness and righteousness and he will not accept uh, the compromised uh, sinful characteristics of most Christians that call themselves servants of God today. He won't recognize it, he won't honor it, and he won't release his power to be used in their type of ministry. And so he says, woe unto you. Why? Because you pastors have destroyed and scattered the sheep of my pasture. And you know, today I, I walk in a circle now uh, wherein I, I'm not really involved in the organized church very much anymore. I still uh, love the gospel, love the Lord, preach the word to the best of my ability. Uh, but uh, uh, as I have uh, come to this ministry that God has allowed me to have, I come to the conclusion because I hear many, many, many times, uh, well, pastor, I was raised in this church. Pastor, I, I accepted the Lord in this church. Pastor, I, I was baptized in this church. Pastor, I, I, I used to hear the word of God. But now I don't have any place I can go to church because in spite of all the churches, and we have multitudes of them, I cannot find a pastor that is preaching God's word according to the scriptures. Think of that. I can't find a pastor that preaches the Word of God according to the Scriptures. Now, what's caused all of this stuff that we have today? Well, we no longer preach that homosexual is a sin, that uh, uh, the activity of the lesbian is a, a sin. It's corrupt. It's unclean. It's impure. We don't preach that a liar is not going to find his place in heaven. And uh, we don't preach that those who are uh, adulterers and whoremongers, uh, uh, well, God understands. He knows you're in the flesh and the flesh is weak. But Jesus died for us. Hey, that didn't change God's law. That didn't change God's word. That didn't change the power of the word to do a, a work in people's lives and, and to convict them of their sin and cause them to come out of their sin and serve the Lord and fear the judgment of God that comes upon those who are supposed to be believers but live just like they always lived in the world. God will not accept that. Well, now, Pastor, I just don't believe that we have to have a list. That if you do this and do this and do this, that's sin. And if you don't do this and you do this and this and this, that's righteousness. No. I'm talking about what's in the heart. I'm talking about what's in the heart. The heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The actions come forth. And so the deeds in and of themselves, yes, they're still sin, but the problem is that there is no change, no fear, no, and by that I mean reverence and respect and, and righteousness of, uh, the, as we walk in the ability of the Lord Jesus Christ, the man who died for our sins, paid the price for our sins, took our sins upon him at the cross, and paid the debt that we owe unto uh, the satanic powers of hell because of our sin. Yes, he did all of that. But when we are converted, we are expected to live like the Word of God tells us to live. Well, now, Pastor, uh, uh, I, th I thought I was doing that. Well, have you read your Bible? Have you come to the place where it's more than just a, a, a symbol that sits on a shelf? gathering dust? Or do you read it? Do you look at it? Do you study it? 
Do you come to the place where you find yourself hungering for the truth that's hid there uh, unto those who have not come to the place of spiritual insight? And so it's important, beloved, for you. Yes, I know the pastors are guilty because they do not preach the whole word of God. They ignore part of it. If you ignore part of it, you're taking it away from the people and you are telling the people this is all there is to it. And so I'm telling you folks, and I'm telling you if you're a pastor that happens to be listening, it's time to get back to the Word of God, the old-fashioned preaching and teaching and prophesying that went forth under the anointing of the Holy Spirit when men walked in uh, holy reverence before the Heavenly Father and recognized that they were just vessels giving forth the life-changing, life-giving Word of God that was given unto them them through the Old Testament prophets and the, and the uh, uh, teachers of the flock uh, and also the New Testament prophets uh, and the New Testament preachers that are supposed to be preaching the power of God and they are not doing it in many cases, most cases. But, 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 well that's the problem. We've got too many but, but, buts in there. We need to come to the place where we recognize what God said in the book of Revelation. If you take away or add to the word of God, you have no place in the eternal kingdom of our heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh my. Well, I haven't taken anything from it. It's still there. No, you've just hidden it from the people because you don't tell them that God judges sin. Yes, God judges sin, even in the Christian, because of, of all people. He has given the Christian the, the joyful gift of, of cutting away the sin from his life, erasing uh, the conditions of sin that existed before he met Christ or she. And it is a situation where... We haven't recognized that we have the responsibility to come into the fullness of the righteousness in Jesus Christ. And God made it very clear that if Christ is in us, sin should have departed from us. Jesus said in verse 2, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people. See, they were guilty way back there in the early days of God's relationship with Israel. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. In other words, they were not concerned about the welfare and the needs and the, and the encouragement that uh, the people needed. And so uh, they didn't care to do anything about that. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings. I think, beloved, the land of America is having the visitation of the Lord visiting the evil doings that we have either performed or the righteousness that we have rejected and failed to perform. And uh, he is bringing the evil that we've sent forth back upon us. You say, well, I just don't think God works that way. Well, you need to look at how he allowed the children of Israel, once delivered from the land of Egypt, to, to go right back into uh, the judgment of God and the uh, fulfillment of God's promise that if they lived righteously under the law, that he would honor that, and that if they did not, he would judge them, and they would pay the price for their rebellion and disobedience. And they went into captivity after captivity. They went into sin after sin. They became worse than they were before they ever uh, had the visitation of God. And uh, as a result, they lived in a situation where they become intensely corrupt to the point that nothing brought condemnation and conviction upon their spirit that they were doing wrong and uh, needed to turn from their evil ways until God brought them in such a place of, of uh, uh, reaping what they had sown 
that they finally would call upon God and plead for his mercy. Today we don't find anybody saying to America, time to repent and fall upon your face before the Lord and ask God for his mercy and cleanse us as a people, cleanse us as an individual. Now God in the Old Testament had a law that was very real, very pure, very good, except for one thing. It was impossible for those who were bound in sin uh, from birth uh, to live by the law successfully because the spirit within them had not been changed. They still had that old nature that they were born with. And consequently, the uh, Bible says that God looked upon the face of the earth and there was no man that could pay the price for our sin and judgment. And so he sent Jesus to die for us that we might be restored into the kingdom of God. Well, I'll go on. Verse 3, And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. Now hear me. This is a promise of God that in spite of their sin, that if they will return, if they will repent, if they will come to the place where they acknowledge their responsibility to live a holy and a righteous life through the help of the Holy Spirit and by the cleansing of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ within the Spirit, then he said, I will still minister to you, I will still deal with you, I will still bless and, and prosper you. Today, it's happening with individuals. It happened with individuals in the Old Testament. But what's happened? God said, you scattered my sheep. And then he says, I've driven them away from you. Why did he do that? Because they were not hearing the truth. Because they were being led down a pathway of corruption and compromise and sin, ungodliness, unholiness, uh, uh, terrible, terrible, filthy uh, activities were taking place, uh, sin against the, their own body and the body of others, uh, and on and on it went. And yet in all of that, God had a remnant, and he has a remnant today. And I want you to understand, beloved, if you're part of that remnant, and if you've come to the place where you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Redeemer, and by that come to the point you recognize the lifestyle you were living was wrong and have repented, that means that you turn from the old ungodliness and you walk in the purity and the righteousness of the Spirit of God today, uh, then you're part of the remnant. If you have made a commitment but did not keep it by living for God, you are in a worse condition now than you were before you made the commitment unto God. Because now you know you're guilty. You know there's a way. You know God's made a, a, an escape hatch for you from the forces of eternal darkness. You know that the power of God is able to keep and sustain you in difficult times and uh, the tumultuous times that come our way. And certainly as we're headed now, I'm convinced into uh, the time of sorrows that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24 would come, I'm convinced we're there. And it's just beginning and it's going to get worse and it's going to get worse and it will get worse. Why? Because the enemy now has been given full and free control of the very atmosphere around this earth. And certainly he has his uh, uh, body of evildoers on the face of the earth scattered everywhere. You can't go any place without seeing them, being confronted by them, and uh, uh, being affected by their hatred and their evil deeds. And so, beloved, it's time for us to recognize, and I'm speaking as a pastor, I'm speaking uh, as one who uh, has uh, uh, failed in some ways, no doubt about that, but thank God the grace and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses and when he cleanses, God never remembers that failure anymore. 
And so you and I need to come to the place, if you're a man of God, if you're a head of a household and love the Lord, it's your responsibility if you don't have a pastor to be the pastor of that household and to give them the Word of God and to teach them how to live a righteous life. You can't teach them how to do it if you're not doing it yourself. And so, beloved, if you are in a place of spiritual leadership in a little tiny small measure of one household, or if you're ministering and pastoring and teaching entire groups, then you've got even a greater responsibility because you have a greater chore to be done. You cannot do it, beloved, with just the doctrine that, well, Jesus loves you and he understands. Jesus does love you. He loved you enough to die for you. But on the other hand, he did not say that because he died for you uh, that you could go ahead and live in your stinking sin, ignore the word of God, not walk in the righteousness of Jesus Christ that was bought with his very life, the shedding of his blood for you and for me. You can't, you can't get anywhere with the power of God unless you live in the righteousness of God and you preach the truth of his word. God says we're to love everybody. God says Jesus came and died for everybody. None of that is true. Jesus came and died for those who would believe upon him, accept him as the only begotten son of the living God, and acknowledge that he died for our sin and then they chose to live by it and to walk in the statutes and the righteousness of the commands of God. Here and there, the word of God is being preached straightforward and truthfully. This old preacher does the best he can to make it known, beloved, that God not only loves, he does hate. You say, I don't believe that. Well, the Bible says he does. He said, Jacob... Jacob representing Israel? No, not the Jews. Jacob representing the Israelites and Esau representing the heathen, ungodly, full of evil and corruption. What did he say? I love Jacob. I hate Esau. So Jesus said, I came only unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But even in the Old Testament, he did not deny their entrance into his kingdom if they believed in him. We've taken John 3.16, and though most people quote it accurately, they don't teach it accurately. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that everyone can be saved. No, that's not what it says. Well, because God loves everybody, he so loved the world that anyone who loves the rest of the world can be saved. No, he didn't say that. He said that whosoever believeth on the Son of God, whosoever believeth, the gift of God was sent to them, can be saved. I have to believe. Yeah, that's the point I'm trying to make. Well, I believe. Well, do you or don't you? Now, what belief is, is a position that you take in your spirit. Your spirit transfers it into your intellect, your brain. And as a result of that, you walk in the power and the ability that God gave you through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. If you believe that it's true, but you aren't doing anything about it, you aren't uh, taking action on what God tells you to do in the scriptures, well, what did God tell us to do? Well, if you go to Acts 2, 38, 39, he said that you needed to repent of your sin and to be baptized for the remission of sin and you need to come to that place wherein you 
not only believe with your intellect, but true belief demands action. It demands obedience. And so, you have to, once you believe, you know, Satan believes that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Oh, he'll lie about it and tell you that's not true, but you need to know he believes it because he got kicked out of heaven and he got kicked out of the, uh, the place in the kingdom of God that was rightfully his because of his sin. And as a result, he does everything he can do to distort the word of God and to deceive those who are really genuinely trying to serve the Lord with all of their heart. And you think, well, because I became a Christian, everything's all set, sealed, and delivered. No. The Bible says, he that is faithful unto the end shall be saved. If you're not living what God told you to live, after giving you the ability to live it, that's in the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ the Lord and the work of the Holy Spirit within your life, if you're not doing that, you're not a believer. Because if you really believed, you'd take action and you would take a very careful consideration of how you live your life. And so, beloved, I'm not just speaking to the pastors, but I want you to know God was speaking to them, and I'm speaking what God spoke to them, and God said, because you have driven my people away from me. Well, how did they drive the people away from him? By telling them they did not have to live as God said they should live by putting other uh, commands upon them in the name of God that was not of God, which they could not live by because they were not God's word, had no power in them. And so we're in a position, beloved, where in our land today, there are still a few leaders of, of supposed Christianity that know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and preach and teach the Word of God as the Bible declares it. Instead, we find all kinds of efforts being made today to take the Word of God and to try to prove that it's in error. That it's not really saying what it means. That God really didn't mean what He said. And what's that all about? It's about lying and teaching unholy doctrines that will send you into the very pits of hell itself. Okay, let's go on. Then in verse 4, he says something that's very important for you and for me. Wherever we stand in the kingdom of God today, or whether we're outside of the kingdom and don't know it because we've been fed a bunch of lies about our responsibility to live for God. Verse 4 in Jeremiah 23 declares, And I will set up shepherds over them. He's saying, by the way, this is prophecy coming from Jeremiah that involves the very last days of time. And so he says, I will put shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. We're not blessed like we once were blessed. But as a people, we have fallen into sin as a nation, we have selected ungodly, unholy leadership to rule over us, and we are imprisoned with the false doctrines and the lies of, of ungodly national leadership to the degree, beloved, that God cannot do anything in our land in great abundance because of the sin of the majority of his people in this land. Verse 5, Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. How did I say this is talking about the last days? Because that king has not taken the position that the scripture declares he will take. That is yet to come. 
That is when Jesus comes back uh, with those who have gone on before us to be with the Lord. And we, if we're still here, will be gathered together unto him. And he's going to sit down on this earth. And he's going to rule and reign righteously as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And those who are righteous in his kingdom are going to be instruments within his government. And we're going to be kings and priests with him. But it's not taking place yet. That's why I say to you, those who teach that all of this took place in 70 AD, they've lost it somewhere. They're way out here. When we see the fulfillment take place of what God said would come in the last days, then we can say God has fulfilled all of the prophecy of his word. He's fulfilled a lot of it, and he's fulfilling much of it even as we speak. But Jesus hasn't come back yet. And so these things that Jeremiah is speaking of right here is saying, you have deserted the Lord, but you need to know that the day is coming when he's coming back. And when he comes back, it's going to be a time of justice and holiness. Praise the Lord. Verse 6, in his days Judah shall be saved. Well, they aren't today. And Israel shall dwell safely. We aren't safe today. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. That's what we're going to call him. Today, anytime you hear the name of Jesus mentioned outside of the conversation of a true believer, is a curse word. He's not being honored. He's not being called the Lord of righteousness. But you see, the day is coming when that last day comes and those that have been faithful unto the last day are going to find that they are serving King Jesus and he is the Lord, our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries whither I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Well, now we hear all this talk about the Holy Land. We hear all of this uh, declaration that, uh, you know, uh, these things came to pass in 1948 when uh, the evil, ungodly governments of the world decided that uh, they ought to make a, a special place for the Jews. You got the point? For the Jews and give them a land of their own. Well, they took a little portion of what God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and called it Israel. And that is what most people in the world today believe is the Holy Land. I want you to know, if you go back and study the Word, uh, there was much, much, much more territory that was given unto uh, the children of Israel in the Old Testament when they went into the land that God had promised to take them to. We haven't even scratched the surface of the territories that were involved. And so, it hasn't happened yet. Let's go on to verse 9. Mine heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, and like a man whom wine hath overcome. Because of the Lord, and because of words of his holiness. Jeremiah's words. I'm fearful in my boots, as we would say today. I am terrified when I think about what's coming because we've not lived as God told us to live. I am aware that there is intense, holy, righteous, perfect judgment to come upon all ungodly. And I'm fearful that even myself might fail. Jeremiah's expressing here. But he's also fearful for his people because his people are nowhere near the place God told them to walk under the law of the Old Testament. And certainly, 
he foresaw as the Holy Spirit revealed to him that we in the New Testament era would not walk there either, even though God had given us the ability to do so. He speaks in verse 10, For the land is full of adulterers. You see, if we violate God's law, remember, God's the one that established marriage. God's the one that established the, the righteousness of, of uh, a marital uh, involvement and, and relationship. God is the one that set the boundary for that. Today, we just make laws to change the law of God. And so, doesn't matter if you're married or not. Now we've come to the place in this land where the queers and the lesbians and the uh, multisexuals uh, uh, who are rebellious against God and live a most unholy and impure life, we say, well, they can get married. That's fine. Well, I want to tell you something. That marriage may mean something to some doesn't mean anything to God. It does promote more sin, more ungodliness, more corruption. And as a result, the morality, the integrity of the land of America is swiftly going down the tubes. If it hasn't already completely been destroyed. Well, let's go on. For both prophet and priest are profane. Hear me. Today, our time, we see clergymen all over this country saying to the ungodly, immoral, heathenistic activities of sexual sin, come on into the church. Come on and be part of us. We love everybody. Well, they forgot that God said he hates some things. Oh, well, if you're going to be a Christian, you can't hate anything. Well, I do. I hate sin. I hate uh, the reality that this nation is being uh, completely indoctrinated with false teaching. When we begin to teach that God taught in the Word, then we will have returned to a point where God can bless us. Now you'll remember that Sodom and Gomorrah came to the place where God could not forgive. He could not give mercy or grace, and he destroyed it. Why did he destroy it? Because it was beyond the ability of God to overlook and to forgive their sin. America is very close to that point today, beloved, if not already there. Thank God there's still a remnant on this land preaching the word and a remnant of people who want to hear the word as God has stated it in his scriptures. Verse 11, For both prophet and priest are profane, yea, in my house have I found their wickedness. They're actually turning my house like the children of Israel did in the old days into a sexual whoredom. Oh, well, the New Testament doesn't talk about that. God didn't say anything about that. I hear that talked all the time. Well, read Romans 1 and 2. See what God said. Verse 12, Wherefore? Their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein, for I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. What he's saying, I'm going to visit them again. I've already visited them with my word. I've already visited them with my Holy Spirit. I've already revealed to them their condition and their sin and their rebellion and their immorality and all those things. But I'm going to visit them again. But when I visit them again, they're going to be destroyed with my judgment. What's he going to do? Their way shall be unto them as a slippery way in the darkness. That's the kind of thing God is trying to illustrate 
to those who ignore the Word of God and the prodding of His Holy Spirit in their spirit to get things right with God, to repent of their sin, and to walk in the righteousness that Jesus bought for them to receive. They're going down a slippery slope, and their destiny will come to them instantly and without knowledge. You won't know you're in danger until you come to the place you listen to the Holy Spirit. And if you continue to do that over time, you'll not be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And you will not hear the warning of God. And like that slippery slope that uh, the evil fall into in their last days, you'll do the same. And when you have that happen to you, there's no more repentance. There's no more getting right with God. There's nothing else you can do. You are sealed in your spirit spiritual condition the moment breath leaves your body. Verse 13, I have seen the folly and their prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people to Israel to err. Well, I want you to know that our land is full of the prophets of Baal today. And I would like to tell you that it's only uh, those uh, uh, that come from heathen countries that are doing it. The truth of the matter is that many of the uh, prophets uh, self-proclaimed, we have them everywhere today, well, I'm a prophet of God. Well, I'm a prophet of God. Well, you need to listen to what I say because I'm a prophet of God. Well, the Bible tells me that when I become a born-again believer, that the Holy Spirit will speak to me directly, that I have direct contact with God available to me through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I don't need somebody else telling me whether I'm living in sin or whether I am not. If I am, I know it, and if I'm not, I know it, and if I know I'm in sin and don't do anything about it, it won't be long until I'll be sealed in that sin because I will be incapable of responding to the conviction work of the Holy Spirit to get back to God. Verse 14, I have seen also the prophets of Jerusalem, an horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. God is saying, you who know right to do it and you're not doing it, you who have listened to the lies of, of satanic uh, uh, Baal influences, uh, you need to understand that the day is coming when God will do unto you as he did unto Sodom and Gomorrah. In an instant, the whole city was destroyed. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink the water of gall. And for the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. You see, those who are in that place of responsibility, those in the theological seminaries, those that are teaching the Word of God on the Internet, those that are teaching the Word of God in the pulpits of America, who are not teaching the whole Word of God, who are leaving some of it out and deliberately ignoring that it's there, are leading those who would be seeking and those who would desire to serve the Lord. They are leading them down the pathway of unholiness, immorality, uh, iniquity of every sort, and as a result, all of the land is saturated with the doctrines of Baal today, and I'm talking about America. The remnant of God, we need to get on with it, and we need to get right with it, and we need to teach the Word of God in all the fullness of the Word else we're going to be held accountable. I don't want to be held accountable. Well, Pastor, you said those on the Internet. Yes, I'm on the Internet. And I want you to know that if I teach something that's not scripturally supported, I want you to tell me because I never intend to do that. But there's multitudes of doctrines that are out there that are trying to define the scriptures for you in a completely different way than they're written. Therefore, 
God's power is not working. Why? Because the Word of God is not being brought forth. And you need to remember that it is the Word of God that is words of life. They say still unto them that despise me. The Lord has said, You shall have peace. And they say unto every one that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. Well, isn't that what we hear today from the instruments of Baal? Oh, God understands. Oh, I don't want to teach on that. I had a, a personal acquaintance of mine who is a pastor of a huge church in the northwest part of the U.S. And he stood before a congregation of pastors and said, don't ever preach on sin. If you preach on sin, that makes people feel guilty, and if they feel guilty, they won't come to church. I fear for that man, and there are multitudes like him all throughout our land today. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord, and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? In other words, who are you out there that is still in the word of God, and still wants to hear the word of God, and still longs for the knowledge of the scripture? Who are you? Where are you? And if you're there and where you are, you need to come out and begin to declare the word of God. Now, one last thought. And I have to close before we go to communion. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. Verse 20, The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed and till he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you shall consider it perfectly. When you're up on the mountain And you've got peace of mind Like you've never known But then things change And you're down in the valley Well, don't lose faith For you're never alone for the God on the mountain is still God in the valley When things go wrong, He'll make them right And the God of the good times is still God in the bad times The God of the day is still God in the Talk of faith when you're up on the mountain Oh, but talk comes easy when life's at its best But it's down in the valley of trials and temptations Well, that's when faith is really put to the test for the God on the mountain is still God in the valley When things go wrong, He'll make them right And the God of the good times is still God in the bad times The God of the day is still God in the night I think today we're going to go uh, back to the 22nd chapter of Luke. We're going to begin reading from verse number 13. 
And this picks up the thought after Jesus has sent them into the city to find a place to have the Passover dinner. And as uh, uh, he comes now, it says, And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Till what be fulfilled? Till the kingdom of God would come into its fullness when Jesus is raised from the dead. Now going on, we find these thoughts. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now with all of that, Let's take a moment and ask God to cleanse us from any sin because after all we are not to take of communion if there is sin active within our life. Father, we come to you. We ask you to cleanse from any guilt, condemnation, sin, failure, faults, whatever we want to term it, Lord. Uh, just make us whole and clean and pure as we receive communion and remember of you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us take of the bread, and as we hold it up, we're reminded that Jesus said, you're to eat of this in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, we remember the price you paid at the whipping post. We remember the terrible torture that you endured in your flesh for us. And so, Father, as we take of this bread in remembrance of the price your Son paid for us, we give you praise and glory and thanksgiving in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us eat together. Now as we take of the cup, we're reminded that the cup represents the shed blood. Shed that the, we might have remission, cleansing, purging, Blotting out, however you can describe it that makes more sense to you, of our sin. Removing it from us. And so through his blood, we are redeemed and set free from the law of sin and death. Let us drink together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you for listening to Christian Living 101. Remember, we are totally dependent upon your prayers and generosity. Log on to ChristianLiving101.org. There are over 300 video Bible studies there, plus many other items of interest with Pastor Applegate. We welcome your prayer requests and your questions. Please contact us at Christian Living 101. That's P.O. Box 72150 in Phoenix, Arizona. 85050 or email gene at gene with a g-e-n-e -E, gene at christianliving101.org at gene with a g-e-n-e -E, gene at christianliving101.org